And please join me in welcoming Terry O'Reilly. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And it's so wonderful to be here this morning. And thank you, Martin, for inviting me. Um, in the 1930s, a legendary copywriter that I have read much about in my career by the name of James Webb Young found himself on the border of Tibet walking through a street market. As he looked around at all the various wares that the merchants were offering, something caught his eye. It was the most beautiful, colorful, hand-embroidered bedspread. The Tibetan trader who was selling it caught the sparkle in Webb's eyes and beckoned him over and spread across his arms. As Young's eyes and fingers ran over the fine fabric and the, the beautiful design, the trader started to tell him about the bedspread, that it had been made for an Indian princess that it had been stolen from her palace, and that somehow, some way, that bedspread had found its way to that market that day. So James Webb Young paid a small fortune for that, that day. But when he thought about that purchase many years later, he realized something very important. What he realized was that he had paid not for the bedspread, but for the story. That story not only gave him great pleasure when he bought the item, it gave him great pleasure for many years after when he retold the story to people. And that, to me, is the power of storytelling. A story, I'll leave that up there. A story well told can enthrall a mind and nestle into somebody's heart and be enjoyed again for years and years and years. We are hardwired for stories as a species. It is in our DNA. It's how wisdom was passed down through the ages. Stories are also, and I know you all know this, they're also magnificent ways to examine the deeper themes of our existence. If you've ever wondered whether you make a difference in other people's lives, don't you think the story in It's a Wonderful Life answers that question for you? That when that angel eliminates Jimmy Stewart's relationships from everybody he knows, their lives become immediately more difficult. That Jimmy Stewart's character had enhanced so many lives, but yet he didn't really think in his heart that he had made a difference at all. Now you can tell somebody that they truly make a difference in people's lives, but if you tell them a story about that, the message will resound. That film plays every Christmas. People watch it over and over and over again. And the reason is because they can project themselves into that story. My favorite film of all time is To Kill a Mockingbird. While so much has been written about this film, I love it. But I've always thought it's about lost innocence how Jem and Scout and Dill and even Boo Radley all lose their innocence. And even Tom Robinson, who's accused of a horrible crime, is really innocent but loses his life. Now you can talk and talk and talk about the loss of innocence in our lives, that rite of passage. But that story by Harper Lee, to me, is told with such humanity that I don't think there's a more meaningful way to express it than that film and that story in that book. One thing about a great story is that it makes you feel something. A great story isn't just information. A great story is aimed at your heart, not your head. So why, I ask, in my industry, why is so much advertising aimed at the head? Many years ago, in my industry, a British ad agency was pitching the British Rail account. 
The British Rail clients were asked to come to the agency at 9 a.m. on Monday morning to hear the agency's pitch. When they arrived at 9 a.m. Monday morning, they entered the most unkept, dirty lobby they had ever seen. There were newspapers strewn everywhere. There were empty coffee cups. There were overflowing ashtrays. The place hadn't been cleaned, it looked like, in two months. The receptionist was disinterested at best and rude at worst. And the British Rail clients looked around, sat down on the chairs, and waited for somebody to come out to greet them. Worst of all, time was ticking by. 20 minutes went by, sitting in that dirty lobby. Then 30 minutes, then 45 minutes sitting in that lobby, waiting, waiting. After 50 minutes, 5-0, after 50 minutes of waiting in that lobby, the British Rail clients were so appalled, so outraged, that they got up to leave. And at that precise moment, the creative director entered the lobby and said to them, gentlemen, what you've just experienced is what thousands of British Rail customers experience every day. Let's sit down and see if we can change that. That has got to be the biggest pitch gamble I have ever heard in my life. But guess what? They got the business. Why? Because they made the British Rail clients feel the issue, not just understand it. They aimed at the heart, not the head. Great stories make you feel. Now, David Ogilvie, as I'm sure you've all heard, if you're, any, if you're a marketer in the audience, if you've, he's one of the most famous ad men of the 20th century. One of his most famous ads is the one you've been looking at there. It's for Rolls-Royce that he wrote in the late 50s. The famous headline reads, at 60 miles an hour, the loudest noise in this new Rolls-Royce comes from the electric clock. To put that ad in context for that period, here's what most car ads looked like in that era. Hold on. No. Can I go backwards? There we are. That would be another ad you would have seen in that era. And I'm going to read the headline for you, because when you look at that ad, you don't know where to look, right? The headline says, breathlessly, you may save a few cents a day if you buy a station wagon with a low price name, but, all caps, count all the things you'll miss. You'll be happier five ways in a country cruiser. Now, look back at Ogilvy's headline. At 60 miles an hour, the loudest noise in this new Rolls Royce comes from the electric clock. So much more intriguing, so much more intelligent, so much more beautifully designed because you know exactly where to look. And it wasn't just the incredible headline that makes this ad so remarkable. It was the fact this headline sent you diving into the copy to learn more about the car. And this is where Ogilvy told us a story. He told us that every Rolls-Royce engine was run for seven hours at full throttle before it was installed. That every Rolls-Royce was subjected to 98 separate tests. That engineers used a stethoscope to listen for axle whine. That the coachwork was given five coats of primer, hand rubbed between each coat before nine coats of finishing paint went on. He told us that a walnut picnic table slides out from under the dash. How sexy is that in 1958? Incredibly powerful storytelling, especially for that era. And I could go on and on about this ad, but here's what I want you to know about it. Rolls-Royce only ran that ad in two magazines and two newspapers. And Rolls-Royce immediately sold out of its North American inventory. As a matter of fact, Rolls-Royce had to increase production to keep up with the resulting sales. They had a waiting list for the first time in their history. Think about that. One ad, four insertions, and a company sells out of the most expensive cars in North America for the first time ever. 
Rolls-Royce celebrates that ad to this day in their dealerships over 50 years later. Great stories resonate long past their first telling. I read a great story recently about Steinway pianos. Steinway had a great print campaign for decades that ran. It positioned their product as the instrument of the immortals. And their ads always told wonderful stories about great artists who had chose to play on a Steinway through the years. One day, in a Steinway store in New York City, a man walked in to buy a piano. It just so happened that in that store that day was one of Steinway's ad guys from the ad agency. When the ad guy overheard the customer say he wanted to buy a Steinway piano, he got all excited. So he went up to the customer and said, can you tell me what attracted you into the store today? Like what brought you here? And the customer said, well, it was the advertising, which thrilled the ad guy to know, you know, as you can imagine how happy he was to hear that. And so the ad guy said, okay, that's wonderful to hear. So tell us which of our ads was the one that did it for you. And the customer said, well, it was an ad I saw 25 years ago, and it took me this long to be able to save up to buy a Steinway. 